Who was Jennifer Fairgate? Many theories have arose out of the death of a woman named Jennifer Fairgate, and most sound like they come straight out of a James Bond movie. But one thing is for sure, this woman died and this case has never been solved. What happened to Jennifer Fairgate? Was it suicide or was it indeed murder? You decide on this episode of Peculiar Occurrences. On Wednesday, May 31st, 1995, at about 10.44 p.m., a woman checked into a Norwegian luxury hotel called the Oslo Plaza Hotel. She used the name Jennifer Fairgate and claimed to be 21 years old and a native of Belgium. She had also booked her room for two people. There was supposed to be a man with her by the name of Luis Fairgate. Though the clerk that checked her in does not remember seeing her with the man. As a matter of fact, there was only one person in the hotel that ever remembered seeing her with a man, but that comes later. The pair stayed in room 2805. The Oslo Plaza Hotel was a very high-end hotel, often used by the very rich and politicians. Another one of its frequent users was stewardess since the hotel was very close to at least three nearby airports. As a matter of fact, many of the people that saw Jennifer assumed right away that she was a stewardess. That they often claimed to see her in a black type suit, very well dressed and made up, um, with a skirt that went down just past her knees upon checking in. She also checked in with a suitcase on wheels, which at this time was very rare for most people in their hotel to use unless they were, in fact, a stewardess. Jennifer stayed in the hotel from Wednesday night until Saturday night. During this time, it came to the clerk's attention that she had been in these rooms all this time and not paid for a single night. As well, she somehow got away with not giving any ID, passport, or credit card information upon checking into the hotel. But it was stated by other witnesses in the hotel that it was a very busy night in the hotel and they too had not been checked in properly and not even filled out one of the little cards that Jennifer had filled out with her name and age and address and phone number and such. Hotel staff had started to worry so they started sending messages to Jennifer through her TV and at some point or another all three messages had been prompted okay as in she had received them. The last message to be sent was sent on Saturday, June 3rd, 1995 at 7.30 p.m. in which someone immediately prompted the OK button. At this point, the receptionist started looking deeper into this and she contacted housekeeping. Housekeeping had stated they had not been up there to clean the room since Thursday, the day after Jennifer had checked in and every since about Friday a do not disturb sign had been hanging on her door. Well since the couple had stayed in the room for three days without paying any of the bill, at that point the receptionist decided to call security. And excuse me if I get this name wrong, I don't speak this language. Espinas? Espinas? N-A-E-S-S, -S, Espinas, age 25, received this call. He immediately went up to the room and knocked on the door. At that point, he heard a gunshot ring out. So he ran down the hallway and hid behind a part of the wall that was like protruding out from the flat part of the wall. So he, he hid behind that and made the decision to go ahead, head downstairs, and 
alert the head of security and call police. He did have a hand radio on him at the time, but he decided it best not to broadcast this out to the entire hotel. And the head of security decided that he would go up there and check out the situation. Well, the head of security makes it back up to the room at about 8.04. At this point, the door had been unguarded for about 15 minutes since the other security guard had been up there. He promptly knocked on the door, didn't get any answer. So he used his, his head security key card to try to open the door. When he notices that the door is double locked from the inside, this is an important fact because if the door is locked in this manner, the only people that can get into this room is somebody that has a security key card. Not even regular employees can open the door when they're locked like that. The head of security gets the door open just a crack and is instantly hit with a horrid smell. The room is dark, but due to a fluttering curtain, he can tell that there is a woman laying on the bed in a very unnatural position. He shouts, but he gets no answer, and he decides not to go in, and it is another 30 minutes before the actual police arrive on the scene. When the police get there, they find the woman laying on her back with a hoe in her forehead with major blood loss everywhere. She's holding a 9mm Browning pistol in her right hand laying on her chest. The TV was still on. The room was extremely tidy for someone who had stayed there for that many days without it being clean. There was absolutely no luggage. There were clothes laying about. But absolutely no sign of anyone else staying in the room with her. Even before the uh, forensics or crime technicians get there to investigate, a message is already sent back to the police department that they have ample reason to believe that this woman died of a suicide. The investigation lasts throughout the night. They find that both key cards are in the room. The door was double locked from the inside. The window was ajar a bit, but the outside of the hotel was mirrored glass, flat mirrored glass for 28 floors. They believed that there was just no way someone could use the window to escape. Everything indicated that this woman was alone and had committed suicide. So therefore the case was labeled a suicide yet was it oh hang with me here there is so much more to this it gets crazy just hang in there there was a lot of strange things that were around this case like when the police tried to trace uh, her check-in card and find a Jennifer Fairgate they found no such person whatsoever the phone number she gave was fake the address was also fake also, upon examining her body, they found that she was not actually 21. Her bones came back as being more in between the ages of 25 to 35. She was only ever seen with a man one time by one person in the hotel who claimed to have seen her with a man while she exchanged money down in the lobby for the local currency, which many people did at the hotel since it's so close to so many airports. When Louise Farragate's name was traced, he also could not be found. Also very, very peculiar, she was seen exchanging money, yet there was absolutely no money found in her room, nor was there anything that could identify her found in her room. She had no ID, no passport, no credit cards, no money. Um, she was a very clean and made up woman, yet she had no makeup bag. They could tell by towels in the floor and such that she had taken a shower, but she had no toiletries. Her teeth were very clean. She had no toothbrush, no toothpaste, nothing. There were several pieces of clothing found around the room, but there was something very strange about this clothing. 
all of the tags had been cut out of every single bit of clothing except for one jacket which the tag was sewn in and could not be cut out of without ripping the jacket and one bag that they found in her room. Um, everything else had the tags ripped out and that is a identifying feature that the police could have used to try to track where she had bought these items and maybe even tracked who had bought these items. The one jacket that they did find that had a tag in it was very upscale. It was said that um, it was such a fine jacket that someone would have to be pretty wealthy to afford it. Also very strange is they found no underwear amongst her belongings except for the ones that she was wearing. And they also found no garments for her legs, so no pants, no shorts, no skirts. The suit that she was seen wearing when she checked in was not there. And neither was the uh, roll-on luggage that she was seen carrying. It was not at the scene of her death. When staff was questioned, the two maids that had cleaned Jennifer's room uh, remembered the room already being very tidy, as if no one had even slept in it. One maid also recalled a very pretty pair of colorful shoes that had been left in the room, which was also strange since there was no other pairs of shoes within the room besides the black ones that Jennifer had on her feet at the time that she had died. Also, they said that Jennifer was not in the room at the time that they had cleaned it. The only sign of a man that they had found was a bottle of cologne that was almost empty, but the fingerprints found on it belonged to Jennifer. The only bag that was found in the room was a suitcase that contained 24 bullets for the 9mm Browning pistol, which at the time was very popular amongst police, secret service, and high-end mafia rings. The gun was also of no help because the serial number had been removed with acid. She was found with her hand on her chest, four of her fingers around the grip of the gun, her thumb on the trigger, but there was absolutely no blood on her hand, which there should have been if she had shot herself, blood should have came back and went all over her hand. Also, they did not find any gun residue on her hand uh, as they should have if she had shot the gun. The gun had been shot twice. One bullet had obviously went through Jennifer's head and then through the mattress as if she was laying on her back when she was shot. The other bullet had been shot through a pillow, went through the mattress, and stopped on the concrete floor underneath. Now, police initially believed that that shot was a tester shot done by Jennifer, but could it in fact have been the very shot the guard had heard when he knocked on the door? Perhaps if someone had killed Jennifer, they shot the gun in order to scare off the guard, giving them time to get away. The very last time Jennifer was seen was 24 hours before she had died. Jennifer had ordered food and room service had brought it up to her. The woman that brought her the room service remembered her because she got such a good tip from her. She also remembered thinking that she was a new check-in because her room looked like it had not been stayed in. She used the words, it was nearly sterile. During the autopsy, they found that the food was still in her stomach, not digested. Meaning that either Jennifer waited 24 hours or nearly 24 hours to eat her food before she killed herself, or she was actually killed much earlier than they initially thought. Which honestly was my initial thought. I've researched a lot of stories like this and the smell of decay does not set up that fast, but the guard said that when he cracked the door, he was hit with a horrid smell. And if she had just shot herself 15-20 minutes prior, there's no way that smell would have set up that quickly. The key cards used for the room also 
would make a log into the security system every time the key card was used to enter the room. Now the card was used to enter the room five times throughout her entire stay. One of these times was between Thursday and Friday. Now, stay with me on this. The maid had said Jennifer was not in her room on Thursday when she came and cleaned it. The card that she had was not used to re-enter her room for 20 hours until Friday, 20 hours later, after the maid had cleaned her room to re-enter the room. So, during her stay in this hotel, Jennifer had went somewhere for 20 hours, and people don't just wander the streets for 20 hours straight. This suggests that she knew someone in the city, or had plans within the city, or had something going on within the city. So this is a clue that someone in the city had to have known Jennifer, or had to have seen Jennifer, or something of that nature. Yet, till this day, no one has come forward to claim Jennifer's body. All the facts about this case are very peculiar, and to this day, no one knows who this woman is. And the police themselves came up with a lot of theories that sound straight out of a James Bond movie, from her being secret service, from a foreign uh, agency, mostly because she was heard speaking both fluent German and fluent English with no accent. So her being a secret service member was one of the theories to a high-end prostitute to someone in the mafia as well as maybe even an assassin there ordered to kill someone now about after a year after this case happened the police pretty much gave up and they actually destroyed uh, most of the evidence and clues that came along with the case and they buried her into an unmarked grave but detectives in the last few years along with reporters and such have really dug deep into this and tried to figure it out they've even exhumed her body got DNA and tried to track her down that way and figure out who she is that way using more modern technology though the problem with that is they need DNA to match this up with as well one reporter even spoke to someone in the government who uh, knows the ins and outs of Secret Service and asked if this case uh, reminded her of anything that happened with Secret Service um, she actually said that it is somewhat like it, that if, if an agent were to go overseas and be killed, that the body would not be claimed, that if they would tell the family, the family would be forced to keep it a secret and be given a large sum of money, that they do cut out the tags out of clothes like she did, only they believe she, this woman believed that the way her tags were cut out were too sloppy for it to be any sort of secret service. She said that mafias also uh, do the same sort of practices, and the way that the tags were cut out were much more reminiscent of the mafia. So as far as that goes, that just leads us right back where we began. But forensics also did find that she had very good dental work done of uh, gold and porcelain and in 1995 this was only done in a few, few European countries and it was also popular in America but besides that not much more has been found out so what do you think about this peculiar occurrence who was the real identity of Jennifer Fairgate the world may unfortunately never know but, I want to know what you think about this case down in the comments below. So, let's talk about it. Let's chat about it. Hit me up. Share this out to all your peculiar friends. And hit that like button. Let me know that you like what I'm doing. And until next time, keep your eye out for all things peculiar. 
Good doing that again. It really did. Oh, uh, oh! I wish I had more time to make more of these, and hopefully I will very soon. Love you guys. Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Yeah. Yeah.